we're coming to the end of the day. We've planned actually a keynote lecture uh, because registries is, as many of you know, close to my heart. Uh, invited uh, somebody from Sweden, uh, Hanna de la Croix, who will uh, give us a lecture first about the successful Swedish registry and then I will follow uh, with a talk about the status of the the registries in Europe and the EHS registry. Okay, Hanna. Thank you very much. My name is Hanna Delacroix and I'm a consultant surgeon at the colorectal unit at the University of Salienska, Gothenburg, Sweden. I am also head of the Swedish hernia register since two years. I did my PhD in mortality and morbidity after groin hernia surgery, the role of nationwide registers in finding and analyzing rare outcomes. I defended it in 2013, and since then I have continued to uh, perform research on hernia registers. Today we have a lot of hernia registers. We have the Swedish hernia register, the Danish hernia database, the hernia med, the URAS, the club hernia, and every and many, many more to come. The Swedish Hernia Register was founded by Professor Eric Nilsson, and here we can see him in Sweden uh, next to our host, Philip Moisson. Professor Eric Nilsson also started um, uh, international hernia meetings, and in 1994, both Professor Stoppa and Lord Nyhus was in Motala to discuss hernia surgery. But why start a hernia register? During the 90s, there was no consensus on how to perform hernia surgery in Sweden, and nobody knew, not, nor patients, nor surgeons, the outcome. The Swedish hernia register started in 1992 with the aim to describe and analyze hernia surgery in Sweden and to stimulate improvement at the participating units. It is also today used to inform decision makers and the public and to support patient-related research. The Swedish Hernia Register is a national quality register with a national coverage of more than 97%. That means that almost all operations carried out in Sweden are covered within the Hernia Register. Approximately 16,000 operations are registered prospectly online each year. The information stored in the register is uh, patient characteristics and also characteristics of the operation performed. We have 30 days complication rates according to Clavian Dindo and also patient related outcome measure one year after the operation. The validity of the reg register is very important. If it's shit in, shit will come out. And it's, um, the cover rate, as we said, is 97% of all operations performed, and that is very important. In Sweden, we have made an annual validity check uh, to see if all operations carried out within the participating unit are registered. And we can see that 97% are registered. It is also important that the parameters registered in the register are correct. And uh, we, each year we check 10% of all participating units to see if what they register in the register are correct. And we find that 98% of all uh, variables registered are correct, which is very important for, for our research. The aim was to describe and analyze, and we have annual reports coming out each year. One annual report covering the whole nation and also unique reports for each participating unit so they can uh, improve their results or be happy about their good results. This is an example from the um, from the whole uh, nation, and we can see that the method of operation in Sweden has changed during the last 27 years. In 1992, almost all operations were performed uh, using suture repair, as we can see from the green line here. This is men. This is the suture repair. That has gone down to almost zero today. We also have, the during the 90s, we had uh, Liechtenstein coming up. In Sweden, we call it the open mesh repair. 
And this is really uh, going more than 80% during 2010 was used using the Liechtenstein technique. Uh, the laparoscopic techniques are in, uh, coming, but not so much in men as in women. Only 30%, maybe 25-30% are performed using the laparoscopic techniques. In women, however, it's different. Here we can see the suture technique in 92 has, all, has also dropped. And the Liechtenstein repair here, the red line, uh, start, was stopped to use around 2008 and has gone down since then. Instead, we are, for women, using the laparoendoscopic techniques. And in Sweden, it's mainly the TEP method. Uh, we analyze risk of reoperation, and as we cover 97% of all operations, we can see that any reoperation in Sweden, even though the reoperation takes place at another place. Here we can see the risk of reoperation versus method of operation in women. And as we see here, the results from the laparoscopic technique, the TEP technique, is um, much better for women concerning risk of reoperation. After two years, only 1% are reoperated for recurrence, while other, all other techniques, it's much higher. It's almost 3% for the other techniques. And it's, the difference is statistically significant. In men, however, it's quite different. Here we can see the TEP and TAP technique. It's uh, giving a higher risk of reoperation in men than in women. For men, the open anterior measure repair, the Liechtenstein technique, is far superior concerning risk of reoperation. After two years, only 1% is reoperated. But have we improved since the register started? I think we can say that we have. Between 1902 and 2000, this is a blue line, we can see that the risk of reoperation is higher than it is today. Actually, the yellow line is a little bit higher than the red one. It's not significantly significant, it's not statistically significant. However, we can see a trend that the risk of reoperation is actually increasing again in Sweden. And that is so important that we look into this data. We use the register to support local improvement and we give each participating unit annual feedback. Here we can see a risk of reoperation from a local unit that is doing really good. We can see the blue line is risk of reoperation uh, from this local unit and the red one is the nation as a whole. And we can see that after almost eight years, it's only 1% risk of reoperation after laparoscopic technique. For open technique, it's a little bit higher, but it's, uh, it's still better than the uh, nation as a whole. This is a worse example, and this is actually um, one resident that wrote to me and asked me, what are we doing wrong in this uh, hospital? And we can see that the red line is still the nation, and this is their unit. After one year, 7% of the patients are reoperated because of a recurrence, and that is laparoendoscopic techniques. This is really disturbing because we know that at this unit, something is not uh, right. And the register is used to, to catch up these things to see and also to get back at them to see that they are improving. When we talk about studies, the randomized control trials are seen as golden standard. They study the efficacy, that is what happens in the hands of experts under optimal circumstances and for selected patients. The randomization is the strength of this, making sure that the intervention is the only difference between the groups. However, patients are selected, they are excluded, and hence, these studies have a lower external validity. Register studies, on the other hand, are observational studies. They study the effect effectivity, the results in routine care. 
This can be seen as a complement to randomized controlled trial. We can study what happens when a method is implemented for all surgeons and for all patients in a nation. We can study rare events such as mortality, morbidity, and for the example of Ingen Herner, we can also study women. We can uh, study outcome that requires a long follow-up that is very expensive and difficult to do with randomized controlled trials. And we can study outcome that requires large volume, volumes, example, to compare different types of meshes. Inguinal hernia in women is a very good example on how you can use register, hernia registers. In 2005, Koch et al. reported that, um, and they had 6,800 hernia repair in women collected within the hernia register. At the re-operation, it was found that 40% of these women that were operated for an England hernia, in fact, were re-operated because of a femoral hernia. Compared to men, that was only 5% in, in, in men. The conclusion were that women were re-operated early due to a missed femoral hernia. And our hypothesis would be that it could be better to use a technique visualizing all hernia sites when operating on women. And I've already showed you this slide, but you can see that what happened when we changed technique in women is that when you use the laparoendoscopic technique in women, the risk of reoperation has gone down dramatically. We can study rare events with the register. Here we have the standardized mortality rate. So we are comparing the mortality rates so after hernia surgery with that of the entire nation. And that is justified for um, age. And we can see that men, they don't have so much increased mortality ratio. So, however, women have a fourfold increase, sorry about that, have a fourfold increase in uh, mortality rates after hernia surgery. If we only select the elective patients, we can see that the mortality rate so is actually lower than in with the nation. However, that is due to that we select patients before operation. If you have an emergency hernia repair, the mortality rate so is six times that uh, of the nation. And if you also have to do a bowel resection, it's 20 fold increased. That research actually melted down to that we uh, collected all the journals from the nation uh, where patient had died after groin hernia surgery. And we saw that a lot of women were, uh, they had missed a lot of women with bowel obstruction and they had not looked for groin hernia in, in them, uh, making time to surgery a lot longer when, uh, than necessary. Um, type of mesh. We have to choose between different types of mesh today. Here we have a picture from Kökeling et al. Uh, from their article, The Importance of Registers in Post-Marketing Surveillance of Surgical Meshes. And here we can see that the recurrence rate is much higher for the physio mesh than all other meshes. And this is so important that we find this type of errors, these type of uh, anomalies within our uh, field of surgery. And for this, we can use our registers. Uh, within the Swedish hernia registers, we have also um, thought about this type of mesh and we have examined for the self-gripping mesh. We saw no, uh, no difference between self-gripping mesh and normal mesh. Um, and we have also looked at um, heavyweight and uh, lightweight meshes. It's uh, Melke and Michel in Sweden that have, have uh, covered this kind of uh, uh, research. And we can see that the, it's a lower recurrence rate with heavyweight meshes compared to lightweight meshes in laparoscopic TEP uh, after growing hernia repair in Sweden. However, the pain, the chronic pain was no difference. Uh, 
Here we have, after one year in Sweden, we send a questionnaire to patients. And this study was made by Lundström et al. And we, can have, we have a 75% answering rate, which is very good. Um, they graded the pain into seven uh, stages. And four was pain that cannot be ignored and interferes with daily activities. And for all type of methods of operation, we can see that it was only the tech repair that was less mesh less uh, pain compared to the open anterior mesh repair. However, the recurrence rate in men was twice as uh, high. We also use um, pain as a local improvement. We get on our annual reports to each participating unit, they get their, uh, what their patients um, have thought about pain. So they can see uh, how many, number one is no pain at all. And they can see, compare with the uh, nation as a whole, how much pain their patients have. So I would, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for letting me be here. And I'm sorry not to be in Belgium, in Ghent, but I send my best regards from uh, my father, Eric Nilsson, that uh, started this hernia register. And the best regards from Sweden. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Since this is keynote lectures, we will not have question and answers, but uh, I would like to add to this uh, a talk on the European perspective on a, on a registry. Uh, these are my disclosures. You've seen them before. Uh, additional to this talk, a disclosure is that I'm president elect of the European Hearing Society and I'm the founding chairman of EuroHS, the European Registry for Abdominal Wall Hernias. Also, I have to disclose that many of these slides uh, have been made by Iris Kai Lanhase, who is what, uh, the project manager for UHS. The history starts actually in 2008 for this. And uh, I gathered here in Ghent in the Marriott Hotel uh, the board members of the European Hearing Society. Because, as I said before, in the diastasis uh, section, when you want to do good research, you have to start with a good classification. So. We tried to come to a consensus on the classification of ventral and incision hernias. This culminated in this paper, which is now, uh, I think, a standard paper and, and used by many surgeons around the world, many registries, many researchers as the basic classification for incisional and primary abdominal wall hernias. This, during this consensus meeting, we became aware that there might be need and, and, and a good opportunity to start registering our cases with this new classification and also the other. So it took us a while to sit together with all the experts and you see all these meetings that went uh, on before we, we actually came uh, to what, is, what was launched in 2012, the EURHS, so the European Registry for Abdominal Wall Hernias. Together with that came a paper that uh, actually described more or less uh, the, 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 the measurements and the variables that we included and what's the rationale behind these variables in the registry. Uh, we also saw it as a, as a research platform more than a, as a registry itself only. Uh, to, to perform prospective research on uh, hernia surgery. Another sidekick of this project of EURHS was the, the consensus meeting we had in, uh, in Palermo in Sicily on the how do you report outcome measurements and results of abdominal wall surgery uh, that was published uh, in 2013. And the last action that we took was uh, a combined congress that we held in Rotterdam together with the, the rich congress uh, called Bridging the Gap. So ultimately we went on, the platform was active on, online. One of the projects we tried to do is to, to, to do a comparison between all the hernia registers that are out there uh, in Europe and also the American Hernia Society, that was a project coordinated by IRIS and published. So what, what do we have in Europe? We have, as you heard, the Swedish registry which was really the pioneer of, of uh, registration in abdominal wall hernias. Uh, we have the Danish hernia database, so Scandinavia again. 
Then we have Herniamet, very successful database that was uh, started in Germany. We have Club Herni, which is a French uh, registry, I think in about 30 centers, uh, registering prospectively their data. You have Everac in Spain. Uh, there is a small registry more linked to a trial in the Netherlands, and we have URHS, where we started with uh, ventral and incisional hernias in 2011 and 12, and we added groin hernia in 2015. So one of the problems with Europe is, of course, firstly, we do have uh, several registries already, but they are national registries. Certainly, for example, in Germany, it's in German, in Sweden, it's in Swedish. That's logical, because we do have many languages uh, across Europe, which is a bit different in, in, in the US, of course, where, where uh, English is the common language for, for uh, all the surgeons there. So it was released in 2012, an international platform, uh, we want to keep it free for surgeons to use and also that the surgeon really owns their data. They are in charge of the data and what will be used with the data. We included all the definitions, classifications we have there. And I've been, uh, of course, as a chairman, you have to be the first one to, to, to register all your cases. And you see that it's, it's, it's really valuable tool, actually, if you systematically register your cases. All the prospective studies that you are doing, uh, you can gather the data uh, in there. This is where we are. We are so many years later, and it's a bit dis disappointing, I must admit. There was never a big uptake of the URHS registry, although we made several efforts to do that uh, for groins and ventils. Of course, this is so because many natural registries are, are, are there already, so people will not, from these countries, will not contribute to an overall international registry. And also, there were some issues probably with the content, with the extent of the contact. Nevertheless, very, re very valuable prospective research has been performed also across uh, different centers. We have different routes, and one of the things that, that, was, that was successful is the open abdomen route, which is uh, a route that was picked up by a German uh, group, and, and actually they have a, a like you see, about 800 cases, which is a very extensive database of this pathology. Uh, also, the hiatal hernia route has been quite successful. We had a prophylactic mesh route, no activity, and also abdominal closure route to look at into stitch uh, trial-like studies. Uh, nobody picked that up. So uh, we've come to a point that I think URHS, uh, me becoming president, I've set my goal in the next two years when I become president in, uh, at the European Hernia Society Congress in Sweden next year uh, to try to, to, to come uh, back with strongly with an EHS registry. URHS is somewhat outdated. You know IT uh, develops. So although also the GDPR rulings have... have uh, uh, from the European Union have, have made it much more complicated and much more strict to, to, to be able to register the data. And also there, the URHS platform uh, was no longer com compliant with these, these new rulings. So uh, the database will, will end as such uh, in 2000, at the end of this year. Uh, we wanted to add robotics. Yes, good morning. As well to... Uh, to this platform, so we added a question on robotic laparoscopic surgery uh, some time ago, and um, this is my cases that I've introduced, and you've seen this slide in the previous talk. So if you do systematic registration of your data, it's so, all so valuable to, to, to have this data and to be able to, to extract papers like this and do prospective registry. So. Uh, to organize this meeting, actually, it's the third edition. We, we had this company grounded, uh, founded, which is Arfico Surgical. Um, and we want to make, actually, a new registry. So input, uh, fast input, intuitive, also the new GDPR rulings. Uh, essential re research tool. We want to include the voice of the patient as well. More patient report and outcome measurements to be included in it. Uh, the registry is online now at the moment. It's, uh, it has been developed. We've been testing it for, for one year now. One of the targets that we do have, and I know that, that many of the companies that support the European Hernia Society are, are really looking, looking uh, forward to having an EHS registry because uh, of new EU regulations. They are 
uh, they are forced actually to do an, an increased level of post-marketing research for which such a registry, of course, will be very valuable and, and linked to the EHS would, be, would increase their, uh, uh, the value of that. Surgeons own the data. Uh, we need a modern, fast, intuitive database. So it's there. You can start using it, although it's not yet ratified by the European Hernia Society. We, the working title was the Awesome Registry, but it will change the name because we want to give it the EHS branding. Uh, the conditions changed a little bit. It's more restrict with the GDPR ruling. You cannot register your case unless you have an informed consent of the patient, and you have to click as a surgeon that you receive that. The interface is, is quite nice. Uh, it, the, the people that used UHS are now, now contributing to the awesome registry all give very positive feedback on the, on the, the interface, that, that the way that it's changed. So it's modern, also you can change your password. Some, some pitfalls that were not there in the previous version uh, have changed. We have also the group function where you can combine data between surgeons, between centers in a prospective registration. The support help desk will be made available. Um, so one of the things is because of the GDPR ruling, all everything has to be anonymous. And actually the, 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 the possibility of identifying a certain data set to a patient has to be decreased to almost nothing. So the patient will be uh, obliged to keep uh, an identified or ID of the case because if you want to put follow-up in, uh, in the registry uh, later on, you have to be able as a surgeon to identify that patient. So you do need informed consent. Uh, as I said, the interface is quite straightforward. It's, it's uh, quite easy to follow. It's not, uh, there's not too much windows that open, like there's a system that only opens those windows that are valuable for your case. So in the upper part, you will see uh, which window is active. Uh, and for example, in the new database, we don't even have the, the year of birth of the patient. We just go in age categories. That's one of the requirements of GDPR ruling. Also BMI, you don't want to lengthen the height of the patient, you will just register the BMI. Uh, so to limit the, the possibility that an individual data set, if you have a data leak, would be uh, uh, anonymized, uh, would remain anonymized, we want to increase that chance. So also uh, patient reported outcome, we've included URHS quality of life score, but it's will be quite easy to, to, to uh, put other quality of life score or patient reported outcomes inside of that. So this is a big thing, uh, URHS quality of life score, we've, we've included it a long time, but we also want to get that feedback from the patient uh, almost automatically we, uh, without really seeing the patient, because one of the issues of follow-up and this is one of the issues with many registries is the quality of follow-up and the, the quantity of follow-up that can be achieved. So this way you could actually generate a token which can be sent to the patient and the patient will be allowed a once in, uh, entrance to the database and the patient will be able to fill in the, the scoring uh, by, by him or herself. Uh, so gathering data, patient reported outcome measurement in a, in a way without really having to physically uh, re-evaluate the patient. So it's a, it's a database that, that only opens those windows. Look, we, 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 we have the groin hernia, primary and incisional hernias. Uh, if you click groin, you will open the, the relevant windows to do your classification. Also operative data. Uh, there's some pop-ups. If you don't know what the EHS classification for groin hernias is, you will get a window there, a pop-up, that will immediately explain to you what that classification is. You will not find the word laparoscopy anymore. Why is that? Because uh, is TEP groin a laparoscopic patient or TAPP? So we, we've chosen to go endoscopic or robotic endoscopic and then for a transabdominal or extra peritoneal. 
so this is some of the new developments in techniques that 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 force us to to renew the data set. Also, more uh, more uh, focus on robotic surgery. You see, you will be able to fill out the system and even the instruments that you use for a specific case. The set of your trocars that you that you are uh, putting in. So uh, we have different routes. We have a nice layout, the, the pop-up windows, so, so you will be able to click on the screen uh, to, to locate your hernia and to fill in the uh, type of access. Next to that, surgical repair, mesh repair. Of course, we want to have include data on the mesh because we want this to be really a tool for post-marketing research as well. Uh, Follow-up. Follow-up is one of the pitfalls of registries. You can register uh, your cases nicely with lack of uh, sufficient follow-up. Uh, the data becomes very, very uh, invaluable, actually, uh, for most research. So you can, in this uh, platform, put in uh, 10, 10 uh, follow-up times if you want. We looked at complications that you have at the timing of follow-up recurrence as a separate variable, and then post uh, uh, quality of life, in this case the URHS quality of life, but you could use uh, other systems as well. Uh, there's a group manager, it's a function that is also in the URHS where you can actually, if you, if you create a group, you can ask other surgeons to contribute to that specific group. Uh, so the group owner, the group creator, will be able to extract the data of that. So then we run several uh, uh, randomized studies and prospective studies, multi-center studies on the platform. Uh, so it works nicely and it's a, it's a good way to, to, uh, to collaborate between, between different hospitals, different surgeons. Uh, we're not going to detail how you create these groups, uh, but it's a very valuable tool. So, good reason to use a registry. Uh, we want it data to increase our knowledge. Uh, also, the fact that the, the, the registry has been created, for example, if you want to do a prospective study on, on a certain type of repair or a certain type of mesh, you don't have to set up your own database. You just put your data into this, uh, this registry. Uh, if enough people, enough surgeons, uh, would put in their data, you can benchmark yourself against other centers, like you've seen in the previous talk in Sweden. That's very variable to do your own quality, uh, quality uh, research and benchmark yourself against other surgeons. Data collection for clinical trials, publications, uh, create studies, collaborate, and also evaluation of, of new techniques, and mainly the robotics has for me been the driver to review the data set more or less, uh, and I think it will be a variable tool uh, for, uh, for, for companies as well to partner with the European Hernia Society uh, to start up prospective uh, good quality uh, data in post-marketing research, which they need nowadays because the mesh, uh, the mesh uh, CE mark is more linked now to clinical research than previously. So we've come to the end of this marathon today, certainly for me. Um, the EHS registry is supposed to go online with a new name, I hope. Maybe we're looking for a new logo as well, so a new, a new branding a little bit of the, of the European Hernia Society. Uh, we want to be able to present this and, and promote this heavily during the next annual meeting in, uh, in Copenhagen and Malmö. And we hope uh, by then that we can meet uh, meet uh, in real life. And uh, we have not finished the symposium. Today we've finished, luckily. We can rest a little bit. But tomorrow, 9 o'clock, we're here again. We have two interesting sessions. Uh, one on the other hernias, parastomal, hiatal hernias, uh, perineal hernias. I'm probably forgetting one. Uh, and after that, we have a really not-to-miss session, I think, uh, on component separations. We have uh, Johan Renard uh, going to do our anatomy lecture. Uh, Eric Poli will give a lecture on the radiological anatomy. 
me and myself, I give a lecture on a very interesting cadaver dissection that I did, and we will have several uh, other speakers as well uh, to talk about robotic uh, tar, which is Bob Blumendahl, uh, and also a talk by Andrew De, uh, Debeau about, uh, posterior, uh, about his peritoneal flap technique. So I, I'm very happy that, uh, that we'd, at the end of the day it's been quite successful, I think, um, and looking forward to see you tomorrow. Sorry we can't be here. This was going to be our gala night.